Test two. Summarize spoken text. Page eighty one. One. The autumn term is in full swing now, and deadlines are fast approaching. So, to help you with the final touches on your assignments, I wanted to say a few words about proofreading. Most people find it easy to spot problems with grammar or punctuation when reading someone else's writing, but it's always much harder to see these things when looking at your own. Since you won't always have the luxury of having someone else proofread for you, let's look at a few ways to effectively do it yourself. When proofreading your own work, it's important that you know what kind of errors you're looking for. Think about the kinds of things you've had trouble with in the past and try to eliminate them for a start. Now, most people know to look for things like grammar, spelling, and punctuation, but don't forget that the big picture is just as important. Make sure your work is organised in a logical way and that each paragraph represents a clear, distinct idea. You might take yourself to a quiet spot and try reading your work aloud. As you do, make sure it flows. Don't forget to check your referencing and citations. If possible, try to give yourself at least a day or two to complete the proofreading process. It's easier to spot mistakes if you've had a bit of a break from looking at the paper. Two. Well, our research team spent a year looking at the way local government is functioning, talking to the stakeholders, surveying the community, and basically we identified three main issues, three main areas of concern when it comes to government at the local level of the town or city. One of them, and perhaps this is the most important one, is that we need to enable citizens, ordinary people, to take more responsibility as co-authors of their civic lives. They need to be able to determine what kinds of services and facilities they need, and also think about how they can contribute in those areas, how they can become involved. A second area we looked at was how to create a public service and public servants who are able to actually support citizens in what they want and need. Now, this should perhaps happen in a more down-to-earth and less bureaucratic way than we've seen in the past. I'm talking about moving towards a more customer-directed approach across the board. Finally, we need to look at the relationships between national government, local government and citizens, because that has not been functioning as it should. We've had over-directive centralism, and a kind of mistrust has emerged between national and local bodies, and it's the citizens who bear the brunt of this. Test 2. Multiple choice. Choose multiple answers. Page 82. 1. Today we have Paul Whitner, Head of Theatre Studies here, to tell us a bit about the Theatre Studies programme. Paul, what makes this course different? Well, I think it's the environment we can offer students. We're a relatively small conservatoire and we offer superb courses in a number of subjects with an opportunity for performance. We've built a reputation for producing both traditional and alternative performances. I guess the course would appeal to potential students for the level of support that's available, and I mean from the tutors as well as from the fellow students and alumni. There's a real sense of community. So what are you looking for in prospective students? I guess we're looking for people who are able to cope with the high demands that the course will put on them. In that way, I think the programme reflects the workplace we're preparing them for, so it's incredibly intense and we cover a huge range of projects, and they will be introduced to areas of performance design which they might never have considered before. We need students with imagination and dedication, who are able to keep up when the going gets tough. It can be demanding, but we have to remember that the college enjoys an excellent reputation for student retention, student satisfaction and student employment after graduation.
Two. For anthropologists and archaeologists, rock art is a kind of window into our ancestors' evolution, migration, and lifestyle. These insights that we get from rock art are highly valued by archaeologists because they complement the often scant information provided by excavated objects. It turns out that there are common themes in rock art between sites in Europe and caves where they have discovered rock art in China. In fact, some recurring motifs in rock art have been observed all over the world. It is truly remarkable that the hunter-gatherers of the Yunnan province in China left very similar creations to the Magdalenians, who lived nearly 9,000 kilometers away in Western Europe and thousands of years prior. Both feature outline images of human predators and prey, from bears and lions to stags, horses, and bulls. Now, both regions were inhabited by hunter-gatherers on similar terrain, but there's more to it than that. One thing that we think it might reflect this similarity of rock art in these distant places is that human beings are essentially the same in their thinking. So whether it's the ancient people of Europe or in Asia, they did things and drew things in very similar ways. Test 2. Fill in the blanks. Page 83. 1. Barred owls can be found in dense forests right across North America. They feed on small mammals, fish, birds, and small reptiles, pretty much anything that comes their way. The barred owl grows up to half a meter tall and has emerged as a very adaptable nocturnal predator. Whereas they've been long thought to live in old-growth forests, they're now building up quite an urban population. In Charlotte, North Carolina, barred owls tend to nest in the cavities of the numerous willow oak trees that line the city streets. Far from being endangered, the owls have expanded their range, and now, in some places, conservationists are worried about the effects they might have on other native species. Before the beginning of the 1900s, the only way to obtain pearls was by collecting very large numbers of pearl oysters from the ocean floor by hand. The oysters, or sometimes mussels, were brought to the surface, opened and searched. More than a ton of these had to be checked in order to find just three or four quality pearls. Divers often descended to depths of over 100 feet on just one single breath. Now, of course, this exposed them to hostile creatures and dangerous waves, not to mention drowning. In some areas, divers put grease on their bodies to conserve heat, and they held a large object, like a rock, to descend, so they didn't have to exert effort going down. Today, pearl diving has pretty much been supplanted by cultured pearl farms. Particles are implanted in the oyster to encourage the formation of pearls, and this allows for more predictable production. The divers who still work do so mainly for the tourist industry. Test 2. Highlight correct summary. Page 84. 1. Now, one of the workplace models I want to look at today is telecommuting. Done properly, telecommuting makes good business sense and companies can make huge savings on their overheads. It can also be a very effective lure to recruit quality employees, but companies need to plan ahead and create the right culture for it to work. It's not as simple as just giving everybody a laptop and sending them off to work from home. Management needs to look at training, security and communication issues before any kind of telecommuting agreement is entered into.
Now, a key part of making it work is ensuring that every employee, and that's whether they're at home or in the office, has equal access to resources and, of course, promotions. The last thing you want is to create a kind of us versus them scenario. The arrangement breaks down quickly if people start feeling isolated or limited in their chances of moving up the ladder if they aren't physically in the office. There has to be foresight right from the start in the hiring process. It's vital to screen employees carefully to determine who will be able to prosper working away from the office. Some companies give personality tests to prospective workers, and they do them online or over the phone to see if they're comfortable with that type of setup. Two. There's no doubt that we have more consumer choices today than ever before. We all think we're good at making choices. Some of us even enjoy making them. And you would think that with all these consumer choices that people would be spending more money because they can get exactly what they want. Well, actually, that's not always the case. Let me tell you about one study that has produced results about this that are really quite counterintuitive. An experiment was done in an upmarket specialty grocery store in the U.S. where a tasting booth was set up, first offering consumers 24 different varieties of jam to try, and then at another time, they offered six varieties. Now, when there were more varieties, more customers stopped to try than when there were only six. But only about 3% of them actually went ahead and selected a product to buy. This is where it's interesting. When there were just six varieties, Fewer people stopped to try, but what the researchers noticed, and what they didn't expect, was that 30% of them bought a jar of jam. What does this show? Well, it shows that we have choice overload. That up to a point, choice is good, but beyond that, it overwhelms consumers. Test 2. Multiple choice. Choose single answer. Page 86. 1. The Beehive is the common name for the executive wing of the New Zealand Parliament buildings, so-called because its shape is very much like a traditional woven beehive. It's ten storeys high, with the levels becoming incrementally smaller the higher up they are. Scottish architect Sir Basil Spence did the original conceptual design in 1964, but the detailed design of the building was by the Ministry of Works, and they carried it through to fruition. It was opened by the Queen in 1977. When it was built, it was supposed to embody the spirit of New Zealand as a nation, but it's never really had that recognition in the way that buildings like, say, the Sydney Opera House have had. In a way, I suppose the beehive was, for a long time, seen as an unfortunate hangover from the 1960s, but time has passed, to the point where people's feelings about it have gone through a kind of ironic celebration to real appreciation now. Two. Group work is increasingly an important part of university study, and students are likely to be asked to produce assignments with other group members. Some of the benefits of group work are that it prepares students for teamwork, something that they will probably encounter in the workplace. Also, work can be shared, and it tends to produce more creative solutions to problems. However, we should be aware that conflicts may occur as individuals negotiate their place in the group and different personalities try to work together. To help overcome potential conflicts, the group can define the major task they need to complete and then break the larger group objective into smaller tasks. It's important to develop strategies to help the group achieve their short and longer term goals and to do this, individual roles, including leader, need to be assigned. Test 2. Select missing word. Page 87.
One. It's been suggested that we get rid of the study of humanities altogether. Some say studying subjects like history, philosophy, politics, literature, anthropology, and so on has no intrinsic value. And why should we waste time and energy on courses of study that won't lead directly to a cut and dried career? They say that what the world needs now is specialists, not generalists. Well, I have to say I couldn't disagree more. Of course, we want to produce well-informed, literate, highly functioning citizens who make solid contributions to society. That's an idea that still holds sway, but that's not the reason that I believe studying the humanities is valuable. People who study a breadth of topics and who have a diverse range of interests are actually better problem solvers. This broad education means they can approach an issue. Two. Surfing has been a central part of Hawaiian culture for hundreds of years, but surfing wasn't just a pastime for the Hawaiians in ancient times. It served as a kind of training exercise meant to keep chiefs in top physical condition. Chiefs demonstrated their mastery by their skill in the surf, and commoners gained popularity by the way they handled themselves in the ocean. As well as this, surfing served as a system for conflict resolution. Young males would test their surfing skills in fierce competitions, during which wealth, pride, and even romance. Test two. Highlight incorrect words. Page eighty-eight. One. Well, there are many factors that can cause one species to divide into two. One of these is when populations get isolated from each other by something like a lake forming or forest being cleared. And there's another idea that as individuals adapt to their environment, this might have a knock-on effect on mate choice, a process called sensory drive speciation. Now, this seems to occur in cichlid fish. They have shown that a female preference for either red or blue striped males only exists in clear water, where they are actually able to see. Two. Social capital is a concept that was introduced by sociologists many years ago. It's actually the networks and resources that people use to deliver social outcomes. For instance, it might be holding a sporting event, running a community fete, being part of a club. It's difficult to measure social capital, and one way of looking at it is the extent that people volunteer in their local community. So you can consider the volunteering rate as an indicator for how healthy a community is. You can also look at something called a well-being index, the way people think about their lives and how trusting they are of others, their general perception of the value of their life. Test 2. Write from dictation. Page 89. 1. The course has been updated to reflect the current situation. Two. Agenda items should be submitted by the end of the day. Three. Popular culture is now a serious subject of academic inquiry.